This morning, I want to look at a couple passages of Scripture um, as we're getting ready for our message. And the first one is found in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. We're going to go to 14, and we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 14, which is the text that we are looking at today in our study of the book of 2 Thessalonians. So let's stand and give honor to God's word. Stretch out a little bit, and as we prepare, it's amazing. We are using the air conditioner today. And if you guys are cold, I'm sorry, but I like it. So uh, they always call this preacher, he's on fire, so he needs to be cooled off a little bit. So anyway, let's look at that. For, uh, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, Jesus, we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory, In him you also, when you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. But we always ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers, Beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, November 8th is the day. You know what day that is, right? It's election day, right? And, yeah, elect somebody's already laughing about that. I can't figure out why that is. Because you see all the political maneuvering going on right now in uh, the both the parties, and uh, they still have to go through conventions. And I'm sure it'll be a media circus from the day it ends, and I think it always will be a media circus. But we'll be given the opportunity to choose, to vote, to offer, to exercise one of the, the valuable freedoms that we have uh, to choose the leadership uh, for our country. And being able to um, uh, be involved in the election process is a great privilege that we enjoy as Americans. And I would encourage you, if you have that that, that privilege, and you are 18 by the cutoff date to sign up for the election, I would encourage you to exercise this very important freedom. Now, in the history of our nation, you all know that there's been some very significant, outstanding, sort of noteworthy elections, right? Um, some of you are old enough here this morning to remember when uh, there was an, an election between Harry Truman and a, a guy by the name of Dewey, right? We won't ask you to raise your hand because that will say you may, you may be a little bit uh, more senior in your age because I, I wasn't even around for that one. But I heard everybody went to bed thinking Dewey had won, and they woke him in the morning and found out, no, that wasn't quite the way it was. 
that when all the votes were counted, Harry S. Truman was the new president. Kind of a shocker. Kind of a uh, took people by surprise. And, of course, most of us, a lot of us were around in 2000, right? That, that notorious hanging Chad, uh, was it a vote or was it not, when Al Gore and, and uh, uh, George Bush, George W. Bush, were uh, locked up in a, in, a, in a battle that went to the Supreme Court, right? Who's going who's gonna to be the president, right? And uh, that was sort of a notorious election. And I think 2016 is kind of shaping up to be a, another one of those for the, for the history books and the record books. But this morning, um, and it, you know, it's really difficult to know what's going to happen this time around. But all the elections that have ever taken place in all the free societies of the world, nothing will ever compare to the election day that I want to explain to you today, this, mor- this morning. It, it's an election that's talked about in Scripture. The word elect or choice, decision, is, is in Scripture. And it's easy when you see that to look at it and say, what's that all about? Or to sort of just run by it because it just seems maybe something too uh, comprehensive maybe for my mind to grasp. Uh, God making some choices, right? But it's there. It's in our text this morning. And I really think the reason God put this word choice and chosen and election in Scripture is to encourage all of us. God did it to inspire us. God did it to motivate us. God did it to bring security in our lives, spiritual security into our lives, so that we could rest and live our lives with great confidence, with great assurance, with great hope, because we face a lot of uncertain times. I mean, every day in the news, you're hearing about another person who is is troubled, um, living on the edge of life, and wants to take it out on somebody by shooting them. And we see death and dying and all kinds of adversity and trial, a pre- presidential debating where there's not a whole lot of civility and there's a lot of people blaming and, and talking mean-spirited to each other. And, and a lot of us are just sick of it, aren't we? we? We wish people could just talk civilly. And if they have their differences and they have their opinions on immigration and taxation and all these things, that's fine. But why do you have to beat somebody in the turf to explain that, right? And so we kind of get tired of these things. We kind of get disappointed about these things. And because of all these things that are happening in our world, it's easily sometimes to kind of get shook up about it, to get get a a little bit defeated by it. But we have a God who loves us and wants us to be encouraged. He wants us to live with hope. He wants us to be able to rise above with his power and his love to to inspire us to to know that good things are coming in our life, no matter how bad it gets here because of the promise and the hope that we have in Jesus Jesus Christ. So the, the election day that I'm referring to in Scripture is that moment. That took place in God's existence when he freely of his grace, his unmerited favor, chose, he elected those who he would save to eternal life to be glorified in Jesus Christ. Okay? That's the election day I'm talking about. So as we turn our Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 of the chapter, Paul had just completed teaching the Thessalonians about the future. Now, the last three weeks, we've been talking about the Antichrist and when the Antichrist surfaces in life. And Paul goes to a lengthy explanation of the day of the Lord and what's going to happen and how things are going to take place, the apostasy, the the rebellion that takes place first, and then the surfacing of the man of sin and lawlessness. If you read back in the text, you, you, you see all of those things. And Paul did that to educate Christians because they were shook up. Somebody brought into them a teaching that conflicted or conflicted with what Paul had originally taught them when he was with them. And so that teaching, because it conflicted with what they had received earlier and put things in a much more desperate and dark and hopeless light, Paul wrote this letter to, first of all, encourage Christians and then to educate them. 
He wanted to educate them about the day of the Lord. He wanted to educate them about God's plans and purposes for their life and also encouraging them. So we know in life there's nothing more detrimental and defeating to the cause of the gospel and to the cause of your Christian life than to have your spiritual security shaken, right? To have your spiritual security shaken. It's not good to live my life not being sure of things, being insecure. It's not a good thing to live your life not sure what's going to happen to you when you die. I mean, the Bible is written to encourage us so that we know that we are living with the hope and possession of eternal life. I want you to know that today. God wants you to know that if you're to walk out of this day and this door today, and perhaps I uh, never hope that would happen, but if it happened, you were to die, be, you can have the 100% certainty that you will be with Jesus forever. God wants every person to know that. Because we need that kind of a certainty. Because you can talk to people and ask, are you, are you sure you're going to heaven when you die? And you know what people will say? Well, I hope so. You're like, why do you say you hope so? Well, I'm just not sure. Well, why aren't you sure? Well, I'm not sure I've done enough good things to earn God's favor. And you can say, you know what? You don't have to do anything to earn God's favor. All you need to do is trust in Jesus Christ because he has earned God's favor by what? Giving his life, by living it sinlessly before the world. And he offered himself freely on the cross to sacrifice, to pay the penalty for all of our sins. And all God says is come receive the gift of salvation. So you don't have to do anything. All you need to do is repent of your sins and believe that Jesus died. And the Bible says you'll have the hope of eternal life. John wrote to Christians, he said, these things I've written that you may know that you have eternal life. So spiritual security is something the writers of Scripture want every person to really have a grasp of. That if you face uncertain times, if you face even uh, your own culpability in, in making some sinful or, or horrible mistake or some bad choice in life, you know that that's not going to affect your spiritual destiny, that you can reconcile with your Heavenly Father, and you can know for sure that you're going to heaven when your time is done on this earth. And that's really what I want every person to know when you leave this building this morning. That you're confident spiritually that when, when it's your time to give up your life, you'll know. You'll have the best experience with Jesus forever in heaven. I think everybody needs to know that. Everybody needs to be assured of that. Because spiritual insecurity can shake people up. You know, I've watched a lot of basketball. And um, I, I know it's, uh, um, one of the team, one of the things that happens in basketball, a good coach will really try to shake up the other team's confidence, their security. And how do they do that? They put a press on them, right? All of a sudden, I've told this before, you know, they can be at the free throw line, and the other team just, you know, they make the basket, and they kind of slaunter over like they usually do to take the ball out of bounds. And all of a sudden, the, there's a bunch of people standing there. They just can't kind of just throw the ball. There's a pressure. There are people that are uh, trying to steal the ball, trying to, to uh, force them into errors. They're trying to break their, their, their confidence, their security in this game. And when your confidence is down, you don't function very well. You're rattled. You're easily rattled. When it gets into your head, it's not the skill level that's, that's often affected. It's what's going on in your head. And that's why your coaches always talk about the mental edge. You've got to have that. And spiritually, it's the same way. You need to have a spiritually mental edge on life because there's a lot of things that could bring insecure and uh, test your security in life spiritually. And the Bible is here to provide us hope and foundation and strength and confidence so that nothing that we face in life will rattle us, will shake us, will take away our confidence of living 
even if it's a rejection in a relation, even if it's something else that happens that was, was painful and difficult. Now, God wants us to know that our foundation can be 100% solid and sure because he's with us and he loves us. All right. So Paul sets out in these two verses the morning to strengthen our security, right? To strengthen our security as believers in Jesus. He's building up disciples through the teaching of truth about the wonderful and secure life that we have received through faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. So Paul lists two things. We're looking at two things that strengthens your security as a follower of Jesus. Number one, the first security producing truth is as a believer, as a follower of Jesus and members of God's eternal family, you and I, we all are loved by God. Say that. I am loved by God. One, two, three. I am loved by God. You're loved by God. Right? Paul says it, verse 13. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by God. Beloved by God. Security comes into our life when we realize how deeply and how significantly, how passionately God loves us. God loves us. He's set his heart and affection to us. As that song that we sang this morning, his love is pursuing us. God brings us into places in our life, even here this morning, not by accident, but to communicate to you and to I, he is pursuing us with his everlasting love. God loves us. God wants to have a personal relationship with every one of us. He wants every one of us to be a part of his family. God loves us deeply. Security comes when we know we're loved. This is one of the main messages that God is seeking to communicate in his word to the world. He loves us very much. And not only does God state his love for us, we hear that, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. We hear it in 1 John. See how great the love, a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. That's a stated love. But you know what? God does more than state his love. It sh- God shows his love in very, t- a very tangible ways to us. Very tangible ways, how deep and how great and how significant that love is for us. Look at Romans 5, 8. It says, God demonstrates, God shows his own love for us. That while we were still sinners, while we were estranged, while we were walking in our own rebellion against God, Christ died for us. When we know that God loves us and that we are the focus of his inexhaustible and sacrificial love that brings security into our lives, when we grasp that. Most of you have children. See, a lot of kids here, I love having kids in church. And I appreciate you parents bringing your kids to church. And and, uh, even though they may not understand everything, I, I just... I think it's just a great model example, and I would encourage you to do that. But um, you know as parents, um, your children's security is so much wrapped up in whether they sense that you love them or not, don't, doesn't it? Children need to know that their parents love them, that their parents love them, that that they know that That love is unconditional. That love is secure. That love is constant. That love will never fade, will never fail. No matter how naughty they are, no matter how somewhat um, resistant they might be at times to the things that you are seeking to do in their life, they need to know unequivocally that, that, that you love them because their security in life is based on that knowledge. And um, we can live with the assurance that God provides in his word and has promised that nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. I want you to look for a moment at Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Paul wanted to bring security in the lives of believers. 
who are going through hard times when he says, and we know all things work together for good. You know, when he says that, he says not all things are good because we all know there's some pretty bad things that we have to face in life. Not all things are good. But he says all things work together for good. And I I was pretty intrigued. Uh, There was a a professional basketball coach. I think he he coaches for one of the basketball teams in the NBA. And uh, his wife died in a car accident. Snuffed out. Life taken away. Had three daughters, I believe. And here he is, a coach raising these kids, and his wife is no longer there because the, un, the inevitable, that, I mean, that, that uncertain accident took place where his wife was, was taken out of this world. And he got up in front of all these peers, and he quoted this verse. He says, I know God works all things together for good. He said, this isn't good. This is bad. This is hard. But God has a purpose in it. I don't see it yet, but I'm sure I will. Because I've seen that happen in my life. He saw it when he was a a young recruit going to Notre Dame to play basketball. 18 years old. And he went to his doctor to get a physical before he was going to play. And the doctor said, I'm sorry. um, If you play, continue to play basketball, you're going to die. Can you imagine that? The shock. the, the, the 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 disappointment. Here I'm all ready to get out there on the court and play. And and the doctor says, no way. If you play, you're going to die. So he had to give up his dream to play college basketball. But the woman who died that became his wife, as he was commiserating over this this adversarial situation that happened in his life, this woman who was his girlfriend said, Hey, we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And those words resonated with him. And he saw God had a purpose in it. That God wasn't rejecting his life. That God wasn't turning his back on him. That God was calling him to other things where he could use him in greater ways to impact and encourage the lives of more people. And I saw that as I listened to him speak before this large audience that had gathered for his wife's memorial service to communicate those words. And that's how Paul talks about it when he says, we know all things work together for good to them who love God, who are called according to his purpose. But but as you go on in those verses, it says, for those he foreknew, he knew ahead of time, he knew about them before they were ever created, for those he foreknew, right? He also predestined, he predetermined them to be conformed to the image of of his son, that that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. And Paul goes on. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he thinks about some things that people might think would separate them from God's love. And there's some pretty kind of difficult things on that list. Who will separate me from this? Shall tribulation? That's hard times. Shall distress? That's hard. Shall persecution? being treated poorly because you're a follower of Jesus Christ, will that separate you from the love of God? Shall famine, being without food, shall nakedness, being without clothing, will that separate you from the love of God? Will danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, in all what things? In tribulation, in distress, in persecution, in famine, in nakedness, in danger, in sorrow, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. These things don't get us. These things don't defeat us. These things don't snuff us out. These things don't hold us back. Why? Because we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We conquer because of His love that secures us and sustains us. 
We look at the cross. We see that Jesus gave his all. He put it all out there so that we could live with security and hope in this life that nothing would be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That's how much your heavenly Father loves you. And I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels or rulers, nor, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My life is spiritually secure because I am loved by God. God has set his affections on my life to demonstrate, to show me, to pursue me, to tell me that unequivocally he loves me question is, have you responded to God's love and his pursuit of you with his love? Have you have you received his love so that your li- life can be secured by his love and strengthened by his love and empowered by his love and lived by his love, knowing that nothing in this life, no matter how hard it gets, will ever be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God wants us to live with excitement and joy, and confidence, and security, and strength. Because I don't know about you, but when death hits your life for the first time, whether it's a loved one, a friend, brother, sister, sibling, that's when security can always be shaken. Wow, life goes quickly, and it goes fast, and it's going to end. But it's in those moments that we need the confidence that we are grounded, we are secure, Because nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ. And we have appropriated that love in its fullness through our faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. That's just part of the picture. My life is secure because I'm loved by God. My life is secure because God has chosen me for salvation before the world began. God had it in his mind to save you for his glory long before you ever were alive. And God brings it to pass in your lifetime. God orchestrates the details. He orchestrates the circumstance. He brings you to a place where you realize how great his love is for you. And you're ready by the quickening of his Holy Spirit, calling you to faith in Jesus Christ. God has brought about salvation. And he is the author, the initiator, the orchestrator of it from beginning to its end, from beginning before time began to the end when we're with him forever. That is God's plans and purposes. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We read that as Paul mentioned that in Ephesians 1.4. He chose us before Christ, before um chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says it again. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has what? He's chosen you for this salvation. 2 Timothy 2.10, therefore I endure everything, Paul says. I endure the beatings and the, the people throwing rocks at me. I I. I endure the the ridiculing and all of the the people who harass me. I endure this for the sake of who? The elect, those who are chased, that they may also obtain salvation. That is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. Jesus also taught about election when Jesus told his disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. Right? How many of his disciples came up to them when Jesus was walking out? You know, when Jesus surfaced in ministry to say, hey, Jesus, we would like to follow you. Not one of them did that. Jesus came after them, whether it was Peter, James, and John, whether it was Judas, whether it was Matthew at his tax collecting booth. Jesus sought sinners. I've come to seek and to save the lost. Christ is a Savior who seeks people in the situation of life, in their insecurity, in their fears, in their sins, in their guilt, in their shame. Christ comes after you to reveal his love, his purpose to save you from your sins. 
Now, we may, we may not be able to fully grasp this, this word that God chose us in Christ before the foundation. But the Spirit-inspired writers of the church, uh, of Scripture, included this in the Scripture for a reason. There aren't words put in the Bible to, just, to, just to mess with us, right? God doesn't put things in the Bible just to mess with us, to confuse us. God puts things in there for a purpose, right? And I believe that even though we can't, may not be able to fully grasp God's choosing, the Spirit-inspired writers included this wonderful truth for our blessing and our benefit, as well as for our spiritual security. And this morning, with what time's left, which isn't a whole lot, we're going to roll through this pretty quickly. As you look at the outline, he says, God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through the sanctification by the Spirit and the belief in the truth. As you can notice on the outlines, he provides some, some statements there. When did election begin? When did it start? He says, God chose you from the beginning. From his beginning. Which he had no beginning. Before you ever were born. So when in time was my salvation from sin conceived? The Bible tells us we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Long before there was an existence of a world. Long before I was ever born, God purposed in his plan to save me from my sin. God knew the time. God knew the date. God knew the circumstances that would surround my life coming to respond in faith to the gospel message. And you know what? That could be today. For someone here today, that could be today. Because God doesn't bring people to church for no reason. He didn't bring you here this morning just as a matter of coincidence. God brought you to hear this message, maybe so that you could develop or you could receive by faith Jesus Christ and have that security that when you walk out of here today, your life will never be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, your Lord and Savior. And I hope that happens today in someone's. I've been praying that that would happen in someone's life this morning. God knows the time and date, the circumstances that would surround my faith coming, my life coming to faith in Jesus Christ. His spirit was at work orchestrating the plan that he conceived long ago before the world was ever crea created. So if you're a Christian today, if you're a believer in Jesus, God chose you, he predestined you for salvation. He brought that to light in time, and that leads us to the next point. Here's the beauty of election. My life has meaning to God. Your life has meaning to God. My life is valuable to God since it was his plan long before I was ever born to become his child, right? My life's important. My life is significant. It has a purpose and a meaning. Election just confirms to us how great God's love is for me, that he would choose me and my life for salvation from the beginning when his plan of salvation was first conceived. We need to know for our security that our lives matter to God. They are significant. Why? Because when you walk out the door, you find out very quickly, in a lot of cases, your life really isn't significant to too many people. And some people have a nice way and sometimes a rude way of communicating to you that to you, don't they? That they could really care less about you. You know, especially those people that, that cut you off in traffic so that you may crash. They don't really care about your life, do they? They don't think you're significant, that you're carrying your kids on board in your car, and they're going to, you know, uh, press the speed limit because their life is more important than everybody else's, right? They don't care about your significance. They're not sitting at the traffic light looking at you going, hey, buddy, your life is significant, so I'm not going to press it with you today. Heavens, no. People don't think that way, do they? We all know that, that significance in this world is so conditional. Some days you have people deem you as significant, but it's because of what you drove to work today, or it's because of what kind of, of money you have, or what kind of career, or what kind of education. Now you fit into that circle. It's even that way with pastors sometimes. I went to pastors' conferences, and it was truly amazing. It was, it was a conference set up of different-sized churches, 
you know, the 350s to 750s. But then you had the guys that were 2,500 or greater. And you walk into the room with some of the guys that were 2,500 and greater, and they knew you were in the church of 350, and they kind of, um, he's not in my league. And you walk away feeling, wow. Is that the only way to get significant is having 2,500, 3,000, 5,000 people coming to your church? Is it really about me? Is it really about um, how I have to perform, how I have to uh, juggle difficult subjects to make everybody happy? Is it about me? You know, I lived my way, my life that way for, for a certain segment of my life, and I was very defeated, discouraged, sometimes really struggling, uh, depressed, because I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I I couldn't be significant to every person. And it's only until I grasp that my life is significant to God, and if that's all, and that's all that matters to me. Whether I shoot par or shoot quadruple bogeys, Adam Scott put a seven up on a par three yesterday. I can do that. Right? Does that make him less of a person or me less of a person? Because I can't perform at the level to to, to try to impress people. When my life is significant to God, and when I can rest in the security that that's all that matters, my life gets so much easier because I don't have to play the games. I don't have to dress a certain way. I don't have to drive something. I don't have to put my life into all kinds of peril or financial difficulties to ride with this crew because my life matters to God. And because it matters to God, people matter to me. And I want to communicate to them whether they have lots of money or they don't have anything. And isn't that what this world is looking for? People are looking for that unconditional solid security that my life is significant. And I will tell you, apart from God and Jesus Christ, you're not going to find it. But when you surrender and come to Jesus Christ, you're going to learn your life matters to God because you came to Christ not of your own volition and will necessarily. It's because God had it in his plan long before you were ever born. I think that's very encouraging, don't you? But wait, there's more, okay? What is the basis of God's election? Pure and simple. God elected those for salvation in the past, before the world began, solely on His grace. Grace. Write that down. Grace. Say that. Grace. Grace, right? Grace. How did He choose? Solely based on His grace. Now, When people hear the word election, right, God's choosing people for salvation, here's the questions that come up. Is God really being fair, right? Is it right for God to elect some and not others? Except we don't know that. Because election, knowing that you're chosen of God, only means something to you after you're saved. Before you're saved, you could care less. You're living your life apart from God, living it up, having free. You could care less about God. But somehow God's love gets a hold of your life, and you are turned from your sin to Jesus Christ, and you reach out in faith to believe him, and you walk through the door of eternal life, and you see God tells you, hey, guess what? You were in my plans long before you ever began. Why? Because I want you to live with security, knowing that you are deeply loved. I set my affection and love on your life before you ever began. I came after you when you were living your life in darkness and sin to love you, to show you my grace is sufficient for you, to show me that to show you that all of your sins are atoned for through the blood of Jesus Christ. Reach out and receive that gift. And that's what God has been doing in our lives. God is setting his heart on us to love us. Some people ask the question, isn't God's justice compromised in making a choice? Well, those are all good questions. But when you look at the entirety of Scripture, what you have to do in understanding this, under this, this idea of God electing people for salvation, you see that God is a choosing God. He makes choices. 
He chose Abraham, right? He came after Abraham. He sought after Abraham. He spoke to Abraham. He didn't speak to anybody else. And when God came after Abraham and spoke, Abraham responded to God's initiation of a relationship in his life by believing God, following God. He left his home, his country. He, he went to a place that he didn't know because he trusted in this God who developed a relationship with him and called him to exercise faith. God chose Jacob, who was the second of the twins, not the first. And it says, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. It's hard to wrap our arms around something like that. But because of God, who he is, because of the greatness of his name, God has a right to do as he pleases, don't you think? Who am I to question God? Right? And his sovereign choice of people for salvation is not an issue of fairness, right? It's not an issue of fairness. You know why it's not an issue of fairness? For if God were to act in true justice, none of us would be saved. You know, if God were to be truly just and fair, all of us would be dead the minute we sin, right? Aren't you glad you didn't die the minute you sinned? Aren't you glad that God didn't execute his fairness in justice when you first sinned as a little baby, a little child, when you sassed off to your parents, whenever that was, you were conceived in sin, you had it born in a sin nature, and you proved it by, you didn't have to, now you know parents, you don't have to teach your kids how to sin, right? They know how to do it. It comes natural. But when you see that, right? We didn't die moment we sin. That would be justice. That would be fairness. So it's not a matter of, of fairness or justice. Because if God were to be fair and just, we'd all die. Romans 3 says, there's none righteous, no, not one. None that seeketh God. That's not, our, that's not our natural volition in life. We don't, we don't come out of the womb seeking God. God seeks us. God comes after us. If God puts us in positions in life through all of our experiences, good, bad, and indifferent, he is seeking his, to demonstrate his love, to show us that he loves us, to show us that it was his purpose to save us. God does that. So the issue of election is, is not justice, not fairness. The real issue is grace. It's the basis for God choosing anyone for salvation before they ever came into existence. It's God demonstrating us his favor that we don't deserve. We don't deserve. So many religious systems teach people to try to deserve God's favor. If you're religious, if you're dutiful, if you go to church, if you keep the rules, if you do this, that, and other, somehow, you, you know, you hope you, you do enough to deserve it. And God says, forget it. It doesn't work. I've saved you freely by my grace, my favor that I have demonstrated to you in Jesus Christ. Stop working. Reach out by faith. Come to Jesus, accept the gift, and be changed, be renewed, be strengthened. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For the grace of God that brings salvation. He saved us not on the basis of our deeds, it says in Titus chapter 2, that we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, he saved us. I believe that God's election of us for salvation was provided to us. God informed us of this so that after we were saved, after we came by faith to Jesus Christ and accepted his cross as the payment for our sins, after we came and repented and acknowledged 
our sins before God. After that, we would learn that this wasn't an accident. This wasn't by mere chance. This was by the divine purpose of God before we are ever born. Why? So that we would cherish this salvation. We would live in the power of it. That we would be spiritually and eternally secure in Christ. We would never doubt whether if we were to die today that we wouldn't be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because when Jesus set His heart on the cross and when God set His heart on you before you were born, He set you, He elected you to salvation to the glory of Jesus Christ, it says. You know when that is? That's when Christ returns. That's when Christ reigns and rules. That's when heaven begins to unfold that, that's been promised in the Bible. That's glory. God's salvation doesn't leave you somewhere in the middle because you didn't measure up, because you failed a few times after you accepted Christ. He who began a good work will complete it till the day of Christ. Aren't you excited about that? God doesn't give up on us. When he set his purpose on us to love us, he said, I'm going the distance with you. I don't care how much you go kicking and screaming and fighting against it. I will always be there for you. Aren't you glad you have a God who pursues you and loves you that much? That is so cool. And that's what the world needs to know. That's what everybody needs to know. When did we behold election? When we were saved. That's when it took place. Wherever that was. Maybe you were praying with your mom, like I did when I was a kid, fearful of death. I used to, I used to be horrifically fearful of death. I thought I was going to get shot or murdered, you know, as a little kid. But mama came to me and said, John, you don't need to be afraid of that. Jesus has conquered death, and he has brought life and immortality to life. He died to defeat death as your enemy so you don't have to fear it. God's election comes through the preaching of the gospel. How are people saved? They hear that Jesus loves them, that he died for them, that he calls them to be saved, and they respond. How do they respond? It's the Holy Spirit that helps them to respond. That's why I have this little thing up here. We've been going through this in su Sunday school. Chosen by God before the foundation of the world. But how does that chosenness become known? Through the gospel call. God calls you to be saved. To respond. To surrender your life to Jesus. But what is happening as the gospel call goes out? Ah, oh, the Holy Spirit is bringing about a new spiritual life in me. He's bringing about new desires in my soul that I didn't have before I heard this gospel call. He's bringing about regeneration, a new life that evidences itself in conversion where I say, oh God, I've sinned against you. I acknowledge my sin and by faith I reach out to Jesus Christ, your provision for my salvation. That's when you pass from death to life. That's when you begin to live your eternal life. We don't live eternal life after we die. We start living it the day we accept Jesus Christ into our life. That's what conversion's about. And when we're converted from death to life, the Bible says we're justified freely by His grace. What does that mean? All of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. Every sin has been atoned for, made up for, through the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand before God, not as ugly, despicable sinners, we stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been imputed to our lives in our account so that when God looks at us through Jesus Christ, we are complete, we are whole, we are righteous. And then we learn that we're adopted. God has cleaned us up. He's forgiven us. He's justified us. And he says, hey, you have a new title. You're no longer orphans and strangers and aliens. Do you know what? You're my kids. I love you. My, you're my kids. You're part of my family. 
You're, for, you're part of my eternal kingdom. Your citizenship now is not on this earth that's dying and passing away, that has all these crazy election things going on, that you don't know what's going to happen to this nation. Your citizenship isn't necessarily in the United States of America. Your citizenship is now in heaven because heaven has adopted you into its family. And then God says, I have set you apart to be holy. And I'm going to work in your life to help you grow so that you can grow to become like Jesus. You can think like Jesus. You can talk like Jesus. You can act like Jesus. I'm going to empower you to become like We're missing two things, aren't we? Kids told me, where's the O and the N? I said, you got to keep coming to Sunday school because that's coming, right? I don't even know what it is. I haven't peeked ahead. But it all spells what? Salvation. And you know, I told the class, if you just take this, you'd get really confused, wouldn't you? If you took this, you have to take it all in completion. Because this is God's miraculous plan to save us. This is all that's involved in it. It's wonderful. And you know, I know there's a lot of people who have never, ever had the opportunity to even hear this. To understand how significant God's plan of salvation is for every one of us. And so if you're here today, and you, you sense... You've heard the call of the gospel to be saved, and you can sense maybe the Spirit of God is, is birthing something in you, calling you to faith, to repent and believe. Would you do that? Would you bow in the sincerity of your heart? Admit to God, God, I've sinned against you. But I know you've loved me, and you've forgiven my sins and I trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone to save me. Reach out to Him and receive His gift. Stop working for it. It won't work. You can't earn it. It's a gift that has to be received. By grace. His grace to you. Through faith. Not of yourself. Why? Because you notice the fifth point on election. Why does God do this? So none of us could boast. Why? Because we are proudful people, aren't we? We like to take um, a credit for our accomplishments in life. And it would be so easy for us to say, yeah, I saved myself. I did all this. But you know what? None of us could ever say that, could they? God did it all. He orchestrated it. He brought it to pass. It started before I ever began. And it came to pass in life when God brought me in the conditions of my life to the right point where I reached out and received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Is that you today? I want to know, somehow, if that's what you want, and you want to pray to receive Jesus Christ, I want to know that somehow. Usually we have a song that has people walk up, and I know some people aren't comfortable about that. I understand that. But I'd like you to get a hold of me this week or call me or come see me after the service because I want to know how you can, I want to help you understand greater of God's love for you and his purposing to save you today for eternal life so you don't have to worry because God wants you to be secure in your spiritual life. And the second thing, if you're a believer here, follower today, are you secure in your faith? Do you realize how does this inspire you? How does this motivate you to get up tomorrow and to go to your workplace excited because nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, not even death, not even the worst of situations? You see, a lot of times the world sees a lot of Christians like this. They're not too excited about life. They're, they're caught up in all the hassles and stuff. And through Christ's power, he's given us the power to rise above all that stuff because he, he's brought security into my life that I never had without Jesus. He's brought hope into my life 
that I never had without Jesus. And he's brought truth to my life. And folks, if you're a person who lives by your feelings, I would say stop. Live by the truth. This is the truth. And when the truth, you abide in it, when you allow it to to get into your mind, into your heart, Jesus says if you abide in the truth, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You'll be the freest person on the planet, able to rejoice and worship, to be able to weather the storms, to be able to weather the rejections, to be able to weather the hurts, the sorrows, the pains of life. Why? Because your life, your soul is anchored to a rock that will not move. It is God's saving love for you in Jesus. I wanted to encourage you today. I wanted you to walk out of here knowing that God loves you. I wanted you to walk out of here today secure, confident. Yeah, we screwed up. We messed up. We made a lot of mistakes in life. I want you to know Jesus covered every one of them. Every one of them. That's how great God's love is for us. That's how vast it is. Count all the sins that every one of us have committed in this room. We couldn't count. Count all the sins of everybody in Yankton. Count all the sins of everybody in South Dakota and the United States of America and the world. And you know what? And all the sins of everybody that's ever lived. And guess what? Jesus Christ's love was so great that it covered every one of those sins. And he would have done it if you were the only person that was ever clear. That's how great his love is. Receive his love today if you haven't. Live in the power of his love and grace and electing grace for you in salvation. Walk out of here encouraged today in Christ. Walk out of here secure in Christ. Father, we thank you for your words of truth to us today. They are truth and they are life. And I pray that it would inspire, it would motivate, it would draw people closer to you and to your throne. And I pray if there are those, Lord, that you brought and your spirit is quickening in them heart to to gain the security of knowing that you love them and Jesus died for them, that they want to be 100% sure today that if this was their last day, they would be in eternity with you forever. I pray, oh, Heavenly Father, that by faith they would reach out to you today and be saved. Thank you.